Praise the Lord, everybody. You know, Deacon Moses and Sister Marjorie after service are having the renewal of their vows. Now, you know, that preacher is excited. He just volunteered to preach this morning. <laughs> he said... <laughs> I'm not trying to shame him. <laughs> I'm happy for him. Amen. Amen. I thank the Lord for him allowing us to be here today. Amen. 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 The weather's a little nasty outside, but it's warm and toasty in here. Amen. Plus, it is our privilege to be able to come and offer our thanks and our praise and our worship to God for all that he has done. He doesn't ask much from us. He doesn't ask for a lot of time. The church doesn't ask for a lot of time. He, he lets us have 20 some hours a day, sometimes 24 hours a day to do whatever we want. I think it is a privilege that he doesn't ask for a lot from us. So when we do come together, it's good for us to praise the Lord. Amen. 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 See, all this time, Minister Wicker hasn't been coming up all this time. See what we've been missing? <laughs> oh, we're going to have to make sure he gets up here more often. Amen. If not, I'm going to see to it. You, you can't get up on the pulpit and show out and then expect to get away with it. Man, if you don't want to get called back up again, bomb. Amen. I, I learned that early on in marriage. If I didn't want to have to do something, just do it badly. Oh, I done let the cat out the bag. And my wife's sitting right here. Amen. In the book of First Chronicles, let me just get out of this now while I can. And in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 13, and I, please be patient with me today. I, I, I need to read some, a little bit, just so we can have some background of what's going on. And I'm not even quite sure myself um, completely the direction that God wants me to go with this, but amen. Um, First Chronicles chapter 13, and I'm going to start at verse number one. David consulted with the captains of the thousands and hundreds and with every leader and David said unto all the congregation of Israel if it seem good unto you that it be of our Lord our God let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the lands of Israel and with them also to the priest and Levites which are in their cities and suburbs, that we may gather themselves, or that they may gather themselves unto us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us. For we inquired not at all at it in the days of Saul. And then jump down to verse number seven. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio drave the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might and with, all, or, and with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. And when they came unto the threshing floor, of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand 
to the ark. Mm -hmm. And there he died before God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, wherefore that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself, to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And then in the book of Psalms, number 24, verses 7 through 10. Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10. It says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Amen. And then Psalm 132 and verse number 9. I know this is a lot, but um, I need to build a case and I need you to see where I'm coming from. Amen. Psalm 132 and just one verse, number 9. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness and let thy saints shout for joy. Amen. We'll just stop right there. And I would just like to use this morning for a subject, shout for joy. When David became king, he was faced with a dilemma because the Ark of the Covenant, which is how the children of Israel um, inquired at the mouth of God what he wanted them to do. Uh, when they traveled in the wilderness, when God wanted them to go somewhere, the cloud hovered over the ark. And when they had everything put back and packed up and ready to be taken out, the cloud would move in the ark. They would put it on their shoulders and carry it. But there were rules to go along with it. Only the tribe of Levi had the right to handle the ark or any of the things in the tabernacle. No other tribe had the right to touch the tent, the poles, none of the curtains, nothing except the tribe of Levi. And within that tribe, there was one specific group, the sons of Kohath, they were the only ones given the responsibility to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And their responsibility to carry it was they had to put staves through it. Now let me just explain to you how complicated this was. Other tribes, other parts of the tribe of Levi had to take it all down and cover everything. Then they put the poles in after they did that, then the sons of Kohath came in and they would carry the ark on their shoulders. God had this laid out in a very specific way because he wanted it to be known that his ministers were responsible for carrying him for the people. If you can't get to God, the preacher ought to be able to get to God. If you don't know which direction to go, the preacher ought to know how to get in touch with God to find out which way to go. Amen. That's why the Bible says that where there is no vision, the people perish. You don't have a pastor that has a vision from God. Your church is going to die. So the Ark of the Covenant was how God dealt with his people. And 50 years, around 50 years, the Ark of the Covenant had not been in Jerusalem, the city of God. 
That's a long time to not, to not have God. I know that when we first started with the pandemic and we were only doing live stream, it was very difficult for me. I'm used to, I'm used to being around God's people. I'm used to talking to people, not a camera. There was something about that that just kind of was weird to me. I didn't like it at all. I did it because I knew that we needed to eat, but I didn't like it. And then when we finally were able to all come back together, I was so excited. I think I was more happy than the saints were. I was just glad. I can't imagine being out of contact, out of contact with God for nearly 50 years. This, this wasn't like today where you have churches where we just go to. They had one ark. Everybody sought the Lord through that one ark. So I can't imagine what it must have been like, how they must have felt not having God in their midst. And so when David became king, David who was a man after God's own heart, David who was a man that did want to serve God right, he gathered all the people together. And if you notice, it said that he gathered the Levites too and said, I want to bring God back to Jerusalem. What say ye? And everybody said yes. And so when they did, they put the ark on a cart and they started heading from the house of Abinadab to Jerusalem. Along the way, they came to a threshing floor where they have rocks. And the ark, the, the, the one of the wheels on the ark hit that rock. It started to tip over. And Uzzah, in an effort to help and protect God, put his hand out and touched the ark. In the minds of most people, we would think that that's a wrong thing for God to have done. This man is only trying to help God out. That's all. All he wanted to do was to make sure that God, the ark, was protected. He wasn't trying to steal nothing from it. He wasn't trying to damage it. He wasn't trying to knock it over. I'm seeing that the ark of God, the sacred holy chest, this box that God talks to us from, is about to fall and be damaged. All he did was stick his hand up and just, just to prop it up, keep it from falling. But you see, Abinadab was from the tribe of Judah. You notice what they were doing? Oh, they was playing music. They was dancing with all their might. They were, and he lists all of the instruments, but they were singing. Oh, these, these folks was happy. God is coming back. They were happy about this. But Abinadab was from the tribe of Judah, not Levi. Abinadab had no right having the ark in the first place. You know, I just want us to understand that there are times when you think you're doing something right, but that doesn't mean you are right. He had no business having the ark in his house. None whatsoever. He wasn't a Levite. He was a praiser. He was a worshiper. And let me just say this, because I know sometimes we get carried away in this country. Just because somebody knows how to praise God don't make them a preacher. Amen. Don't mean that. Just because somebody can sing and play music and stir you up doesn't mean that they're sent by God to give you a message from God. I think we just accept too many things, too much foolishness. But just because somebody does it doesn't mean it's right. This man, Abinadab, was at his house among his family 
And Uzzah and Ahio were also the sons of Abinadab. They were the, from the tribe of Judah. They had no right to be around the Ark of the Covenant anyway. Here's what God's rule was. Y'all stay 1,500 feet away from it. Only Levi has a right to be close to it. The rest of you stay back and leave it alone. Now, I think it was very merciful of God in the first place to allow them to pick it up and put it on that cart. But God never told them to put it on a cart. He said, you carry me on your shoulders. I, I just, I just want us to understand that the way we're doing things today is a little bit different than what God is asking for. See, folks want to go to the Bible bookstore and grab them a book of sermons and come and they want to preach from that. That's not how God said do it. That's just a new cart. The word says study to show thyself approved unto God. Not unto the congregation, not unto your family. Not unto the other preachers, not unto your friends, but study to show yourself approved unto God. Then he goes on a step further. A workman. See, a lot of preachers don't understand that the work of the ministry is work. I mean, we look at these TV preachers and they live in a good life. They drive in Bentleys. They, they walking around with thousand dollar tennis shoes on with two thousand dollar suits. Oh, and they, they looking good. And we think, I want that kind of life. Let me just tell you, there, there's something about people. And I'm guilty too. I, I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to just throw it out there at y'all. No, I'm guilty too. We don't really realize when you see someone in life that is successful, they have put some work into it. You can't depend on other people to bail you out and help you out. You got to put in some work on your own. I remember when I was working at a, a place in Indianapolis, some of the employees would be upset at the owners of the company. Well, you know, they got all this money. They're millionaires. They ought to take some of that money and share it with us. I said, now, I have personally watched the owners. They work 12, 14-hour days, six and seven days a week. If you want that kind of money, then you need to put in that kind of work and start your own business. But don't be mad at somebody else because they're a hard worker. Amen. Now that was a natural example, but let's just take it a step further, preachers. Hallelujah. Don't be mad at a preacher because he gets up and breaks down God's word and folks are saying, I really enjoyed that. And you wait until the day you got to preach before you open your Bible up and start looking at the word. And then, and then get an attitude with people because they didn't say amen during your message. Don't be like that. Amen. If you want to be a minister, you got to work. All right, hallelujah. Man, I'm not trying to beat nobody up. I'm just trying to make sure we understand how God's program works. And God's program doesn't always line up with our program. I would love to not have to study my Bible. I would love to be able to come to church and let somebody else tell me what they studied from the Bible. But I don't get that privilege. Amen. Let me get back to the message. These folks was excited. God is coming home. I don't know if we really understand what that's like to not be able to go to I guess the only thing that we can say is like being in jail for a period of time. You haven't done anything wrong, but you've been wrongly in prison. And for, for 10 years, you ain't been able to go to church. You've been around all this foolishness, all this sinfulness. People that are really sinners, wicked folks that aren't sorry about what they've done, haven't repented at all, but you have done your time faithfully. And when you get out, the first thing you should want, let me get to church. When you hungry for God, You haven't had him in a while. 
I'm telling you, there, there's something about coming into the house of God and feeling his presence. I, mean, I, I think sometimes we believe that, and maybe some churches do, where they sing the songs of Zion out of ritual or out of habit. But we ought to be glad to come to church. Glad to sing about the Lord. Glad to clap our hands. Glad to be able to say, Hallelujah, Lord, I love you. Lord, you're worthy of all praise. We ought to be glad to do that. And that's what these people were doing. They were excited and happy because they were just about to get back to where they had been before. God is coming home. But you know, God is not interested in what you want to do for him so much as he's interested in you doing what he asked you to do. And I want to be clear. God doesn't have a problem with us doing extra. I, I think everybody that's been filled with the spirit of God should do extra for God. I mean, he, he, he did something for you that you could never pay for in a lifetime of work. Could never pay for it. And if you did pay the price, you couldn't enjoy it because you'd be dead. It took a sacrifice of blood. And if you wanted to make you right with God, it would take a sacrifice of your own blood. And you can't do that and then turn around and enjoy it. But God didn't want to turn us into a murder cult. So he came and died for all of us. So all we have to do is just come and enjoy him. And sometimes we get mad about that. Church again. Oh, we upset because we got to come to church. Now he done did something for you that you could never do for yourself. But then you want to get mad because he said, "Just come in, come into my house and just say thank you." Hmm, something wrong with that. But what do you do when you've made a mess out of things in your life? How, how do you fix that? That's what these people did. They was excited. They were glad God was coming. And then God killed one of them for stepping out of line. Now David realizes, oh, we done messed up, y'all. He did right in the first place. He, he included the tribe of Levi. He did right in the first place. But he didn't follow the instructions of the Lord. How do you get right once you've messed up? David was scared. Now look at what it says. It displeased him. He was displeased with the Lord. David was afraid. And then David said, I'm not taking the ark home. Now I want you to know that that is a problem that a lot of us have. We will mess up. And then we become displeased because our life is in chaos. But we're afraid of God. So we refuse to take him home. That's true. There are times when we make mistakes. In an effort to fix our walk with God, we mess up. I'm not talking about folks intentionally sinning. I'm not talking about that. But there are times when we do something, we're like, ah, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And in an effort to fix it, we make it even worse. David, after he did this and God killed Uzzah, David said, I'm not bringing God home. I'm not going to have him kill me. But then he heard, God is blessing though. Now, Obed-Edom, his crops is growing better. His cattle is looking better. His family is starting to grow. His house is being blessed. David said, no, hold up. I know I've messed up. I know I've created a problem. But I also see God still blessing. I got to do this thing right. So he went back and he consulted with the tribe of Levi and he said, what do we got to do to make this right? I want God to come home. But this time I want to make sure that I do it right. 
So they told him, you've got to cover it up. You've got to put the staves back in it. You've got to get Kohath to come out here. And you've got to get them to carry the ark of the Lord. And traditionally it's been taught that the book of Psalms number 24 is what was taking place now that they got themselves right with God. Now that they've done it the way that they should have done it and they've got the, the tribe of Kohath bringing them back as they approached the city. The sons of Kohath begin to say, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. Why? Because the king of glory is coming. You can't have the king of glory at your house. Why do you think God told us to gather ourselves together? When we come in, we ought to lift up our heads. When we come in, we ought to be talking about the king of glory is coming. I'm ready to hear from God Almighty. I want to know what God wants from my life. I want God to fix the breaches in my life. If there's something wrong, the king of glory is coming and he's going to help fix it all. After they carried the ark a certain pace, after a little bit, they said again, lift up your heads, O ye gates. We're coming. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. What are they talking about? The doors to Jerusalem, where God dwells. Lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. When you go to church and there's no excitement, it's because you haven't asked for the king of glory to come in. This is the place that God established for my word to go forth. This is the place that he said it shall be called the house of prayer. This is the place where God said, gather yourselves together and hear what I have to say to you. I had somebody ask me one time, how do you hear the voice of the Lord? I said, come to church. You don't have to sit around waiting for some mystical voice to speak to you. Come to church and God will talk to you. Come to church ready to listen. When you come, lift up your heads. When you come, be ready to hear what thus saith the Lord. And the King of glory shall come in. God will fill his house. God will fill you when you come. You can't fix it by doing it your way. I'll tell you something that the devil will do. The devil will try to shame you into not coming to church. The devil will try to guilt you into not coming to church. The devil will try his best to occupy you so that you don't want to come to church. The devil will make sure your boss schedules everything when it's time to go to church. He'll do whatever he can to keep you from coming to church. Why? Because he knows you're going to come into the presence of the king of glory. And he doesn't want that. And then when we get to Psalms 132 and verse number 9, there is a stipulation that's given here. He said, let thy priest be clothed with righteousness. You can't go to church because that's where everybody in my family went. You need a pastor, a preacher that's clothed right. in righteousness. You do. Not because he's a good speaker. Not because he can quote the whole Bible without reading the Bible. That's not the qualifications of a preacher. That's not what God asked out of his pastors. He said a pastor ought to feed his people with knowledge and understanding. If you're not getting an understanding, you don't need to be going to that church. If you are not being given knowledge from the word of the Lord, then you don't have a pastor. If you got a pastor that's tiptoeing and creeping and acting shady, he's not a pastor. Hallelujah. 
If you got a pastor that's greedy for filthy lucre, you ain't got a pastor. If you got a pastor that's more worried about his clothes than his parishioners, you don't have a pastor. See, a lot of pastors is more concerned about their automobiles than about the people that God put them over. That's not a pastor. To be clothed in righteousness means I'm living right. Not when I'm in the pulpit. Not just when I'm at, at work. I'm living right all the time. Some people live right in front of their husband or wife. They live right in front of employees. They live right when they're around the saints. They live right when they're out in public. But let them get off by themselves. Amen. I had somebody tell me his pastor, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, pastor of his church, said when he goes out of town on vacation, he will drink and party. He said, I got to let my hair down. <laughs> Amen. That ain't a pastor. You can't be shady and be a pastor. You can't be tipping and dipping and you're a pastor. Now, first of all, a saint shouldn't be doing that anyway. But your pastor? Oh, no. Something wrong. Something's very wrong with that. But when you come and your hands are clean, when you come and your life is clean, when you know I'm doing what God asked me to do. I'm not backbiting and gossiping. I'm not out trying to tear anybody down to build me up. When I'm doing what God has asked me to do. When I know that God is watching when I'm in my secret place. And my life is still pleasing to him. When I'm going to church where the pastor is clothed in righteousness. He said, then let the saints shout for joy. Let thy saints be happy. Let the people of God be excited about me. Let them come in with anticipation. Let them come into my presence ready. As it said in the Bible, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you haven't been redeemed, you don't have a right to say so. Now you might come in shucking and jiving. You might come in trying to act like something. But you don't have a right to say so if you haven't been redeemed. And you can go to a church all you want to and you know your pastor's wrong. You don't have a right to shout for joy. It's not what the Bible said. Let thy priest be clothed with righteousness. Then you can shout for joy. But it's a shame on the saint that's got a pastor that's living right. Living right their own self. Come to church. Well, I don't want the people see me raise my hand. So. It's a shame when you come to church knowing what God has done for you. But I can't say hallelujah. We whispering real quiet. He didn't say that. He didn't say come into my presence and whisper for joy. Oh no, he didn't say that. My mother lived with us for a while and she used to like watching the game show network and they would have family feud on and then people would come up with some of the dumbest responses I've ever heard. And they'd be like, high-fiving each other. I'm like, that is crazy. Got nothing to do with the question, but they was excited. They on TV. Oh, yes. We excited. Don't let them win some money. Woo! But when you come to church, the Lord died for you. He saved you. And he made you holy. That's not what he said, dude. He said, shout for joy. I'm glad about what God did in my life. We ought to shout for joy, thanking God for what he has done. When God
God has done something for you, you got a right to praise the Lord. We used to sing that all the time. I got a right to raise my hands. I got a right to stomp my feet. I got a right to praise the Lord. I know I have a right. They out in the streets worshiping and praising their God. But when I come to church, I don't have a right to praise mine. No, sir. I have a right to praise my God. When I come, I just should be ready to shout for joy for what God has done for me. People ought to know what God has done for you. They ought to. You should be able to get stirred up in your own house thinking about what God has done for you. You should be able to drive down the street and get excited about what God has done for you. You should be able to ride your bicycle or go for a walk and be excited about what God has done for you. There's no time in our life when we shouldn't be glad about what God has done for us. I don't care how dreary it may look. I don't care how bad it may seem. God has still done some good things in your life. All right. Y'all about to get me all stirred up. I'm trying to preach. But you ain't the only one that's got a praise for the Lord. some things for this man. It's easy to say when you're a preacher, but I'm not just saying it. I stir my own self up. I rejoice when I'm in the shower. I talk to the Lord. I rejoice when I'm driving. You know, there have been times when I've been driving down the street, have to pull my car off to the side of the road. I'm just quenching, pull off, put it in park, get out, and start shouting for Jesus. I've done that. You know why? Because I know what he's done. It's not just what God did for me. I know me. I know just how low down I would be without him in my life. And so I'm just glad. I know. I know I can shout for joy. I know I can praise the Lord. Amen. And I don't let nobody take that from me. Now, when, I'm, when I know I got to preach, I'm trying to keep myself together. But there's times when I'm listening to other preachers. And I'm getting towed up. And the word is shaking me up. My pastor used to call me Jeremiah. He said, you're the weeping prophet. I said, yes, because when I start to feeling good, when I start to think about what God has done, when I hear the word of God and feel his anointing down on the inside, it just stirs me up all over. Somebody here one time said, well, the reason why I don't rejoice is because the pastor don't like that. I said, please, I've shouted more than all of y'all. I had to break the Apostle Paul out. I said, I thank my God I've shouted more than all of you. I used to shout every service. If I wasn't shouting, I was crying. 
You know why? It wasn't because I was putting on a show. It was because I knew just how real God was. I knew just how good he was. I realized what God had done for me. So I just, I had to get myself under control sometimes. One time the pastor told me, you sitting back in the sound room, don't be tearing up stuff back in there. Because I was getting busy. I was enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Amen. That's right. That's right. That's what the song said. I'm feeling mighty happy. I'm feeling mighty fine. Why? Because I'm enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, let me just say this. If you don't know, you can. You don't have to sit and be quiet. You don't have to sit and be beat up by the devil. You don't have to sit and say, I wish I had what they have. You don't have to do that. God is no respecter of persons. God's not going to bless one person above another. Amen. God will bless you. God will save you. God will stir you up if you want it. See, some people don't want it. Amen. I got it. I, I did like David did. He said, oh, taste and see. After I got a taste, I said, I want some more of that. I can't let that go. I, I can't just have just a sip. I want some more. I have to do like my wife used to do me. She said, can I have a sip of your pop? Mm-hmm. It took me a while to catch on. She'd give it back with just a little in the bottom. I said, that's not a sip. But it got good to her. Amen. And if you just get a little taste of Jesus, it'll get good to you. Amen. Let me stop. We got a, we got a service to do after this. Hallelujah. This man ready to shout over his wife. He want to preach today. He want to, I can, who am I to stop that? Amen. I hope y'all take that to heart. Shout for joy. Don't let the devil take that from you. Don't let the devil steal your joy from you. He'll, he'll slow walk you. As they say in the street, he'll dog walk you. He'll try his best to take your happiness. He will try his best to steal your joy. He'll try his best to make you not see you got the victory. But if you stay in your word, if you stay faithful to God, it don't matter what he say or do, you know I got the victory. I got it. Can't nobody take it from me. Amen. All right. I know that uh, it's a difficult time, but if anybody wants prayer, amen, amen. we're not going to ask you to come up. Just stand at your seat mm -hmm. if you want prayer. I'll pray for you from here, from the pulpit. Amen. amen. Now God, God knows how to touch from anywhere. Now, I, I know we like to lay hands on people, but we're trying to be respectful too. God can talk from here yes. and touch over there. Amen. He can do that. Amen. All right, so let's, let's look to the Lord. Father, we thank you right now for these souls that have stood. You know the situations in their lives. You know what they're facing. The ups, the downs, the ins and the outs. You know everything about us, Lord. And we ask right now that you consider the hearts Touch right now in the name of Jesus. Move, Lord God, physically where there's a physical need. Touch spiritually where there's a spiritual need. And Lord, we will thank you. We will praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.